Hi everyone, oh, the weeks go by it's so quickly, it's Thursday again. Uh, my name's Helen and this is Think Differently Thursday and today my guest is Becky. Hi Becky. Hello. How are um, you? Yeah, I'm good, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. I nearly said Becky Roberts, but you're not. Am Becky, I pointing to my Oh, name? other side, other side. <laughs> <laughs> Becky Banks. I do think it's like the coolest name. It sounds a bit like um, Betty Boo, a bit like cartoony. Oh. It's just great. Becky Banks. I'm I quite happy. It. I felt like Roberts is a, was a very strong surname. So I feel that I've yes. traded for an equally strong one. So that's good. I think you have. And your initials, B, B, nice. <laughs> Are you getting used to it? Yeah, actually, funnily enough, the first couple of weeks, I was just like, I'm never going to adjust to this. Yeah. And then we had an appointment at the bank and uh, they said my name, my new name so much that I, I just came out and I was like, right, that's it now. That's it. My new identity. <laughs> we should explain because obviously I know what you're talking about. And I guess it's partly obvious that uh, you haven't just randomly by deed poll changed your name. <laughs> you have in fact got married. Yeah. yeah. You are married. <laughs> How long ago? <laughs> when did it happen? So we got married on the 12th of September. So we just slipped in under the wire before the uh, numbers went down to 15. Right. So, um, yeah. Ah, yeah. yeah. oh, and so I did sneak a look at a few pictures. You looked <laughs> absolutely beautiful. Oh, How you. was the day? It was just phenomenal. I mean, really, you you kind of build yourself up to say, actually, wedding days don't end up being perfect. But I was just blown away. Just every moment of it, I was I just felt like it was the most perfect day. Um, oh, it was weather was great when we woke up in the morning. I was ready by like half past ten because I was so keen. The church service was <laughs> at one, and uh, <laughs> I was just too impatient, too eager, and I didn't have a thorough enough hair and makeup routine apparently to to tide me over um, <laughs> and uh, yeah we got married in uh, at St Matthew's in Ipswich so um, that's that's where my school is because when I saw the picture yeah. I was like oh yeah I forgot you're yeah. getting married there yes, yeah it's yeah, such yeah. a lovely well, it's church where my parents got married so, oh which is really amazing. oh how um, special for yeah. them that must have been wonderful yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice yeah. yeah and so you you just said about the numbers so were you able to have 30? How did it work for you guys? Yeah, so we could have 30 and that kind of includes everything. So the vicar counted as a person, okay. photographer counts as a person. Um, we count as people. Yeah, so it's not <laughs> um, 30 guests on top of no, your just not, wedding party. Not. Wow. No, it, was, it was literally 30, yeah. So yeah. was that hard? That's got to have been hard because that can't have been your initial yeah. intention. No, not at all. So originally we were planning to have kind of a hundred people there for the whole day and about 150 in the church service. And that was yeah. always kind of the dream was to have a really big church service. So yeah. um, kind of as we realized that the restriction, you know, when it, when it happened in March, we thought we were so smug. We thought, yeah. oh, well, we planned a wedding Absolutely. for September, so it will be fine then. Yeah. Um, and then kind of about July time, I was starting to realize, actually, we need to start planning something different. Yeah. And, you know, losing the big wedding thing, that didn't take any time to adjust to at all. But just that 30 was so awkward for the family sizes that Matt and I have. Yeah. Um, and I just I was just like any other if it had been 35, even it would have been quite a simple decision. But 30 right. was just like just really hard to get yeah. down to. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I guess, you know, because the whole world is experiencing this and much as nobody wants it to be anybody's experience of a wedding, I guess people understand that those restrictions have been put on you. It's not, it wasn't you having to kind of make those decisions. I guess people just, people probably just sad as, as you would have been that they couldn't be there. Yeah. And they were just, people were so gracious about it. And, right. Uh, you know, loads of people sort of, I volunteer as tribute type thing, stepping down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. Crazy times. I mean, whoever ever thought that people would be planning weddings, knowing what they wanted and what their expectation was, and that this would be their experience. I've, I was yeah. invited to one that was in April and then got postponed to September and now has been postponed hard. to 
April, May next year, I think. Just yeah. crazy. Those are the people I feel for who have who are now postponing multiple times. That yeah. just must be horrible. So. Was that ever was that ever on the cards to you for you to to delay? Not for us, just because um everything was kind of on pause until we were married. Yeah. Um yeah. we didn't live in the same county. Um that's you know, that's a decision that we'd made us not to live together yeah. before we got married. And yeah. um yeah, it, it was just if if it had been five people in a tiny thing, we would have done it. Would have been still. sad. Yeah, but yeah we would have yeah. done it. Yeah. And, and what um, about even on the day, what what did you do about distancing? Because because that must have been tricky as well. How did you handle that? The weddings are an occasion where everyone wants to like <laughs> hug and just celebrate. Yeah. Well, how did you cope? What did you do? So we try to make it a fun part of the day. You know, it's always going to be a memory that we got married yes. in the year of yeah. COVID. Yeah. Um. So we tried to do things that would make it kind of um like part of the day without it feeling like everyone was tiptoeing around it the whole time yeah um so a couple of things we did like we got three different color wristbands and they were basically something that you could put on to let others know your level of either anxiety or comfort oh. around being in a group of people right um so that you don't constantly have to say out loud Check. you know can you step back from me or or yeah. anything like that so yeah we did that we had um, for my Hindu, it sounds completely bizarre, but we did pole painting for my Hindu, which was very innocent activity. <laughs> All we did, okay. we painted. To, we thought, right, let's have like prop. If we're going to have socially distanced photos, then we should have like props in it, so it's not just awkwardly standing. Okay. So we had these like broom handles, and we painted them with like fun. Oh no! Art. What to measure the distance? Yeah, oh, so I that people see. could like. Cool. Oh, amazing! <laughs> and, oh. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was completely bizarre. And if if I can say this on Facebook, yeah, you know, some people did give me a hug. And um, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. yeah. But we, we kept people safe. And we were re actually, Matt and I were so grateful because a couple of people came who had been shielding and, and it was kind of their first trip out of the house. Wow. And we were so grateful for that. Yeah, so. it sounds like you managed really well that you're initial expectations of what a wedding would have been you know at the time that you got engaged you would have had something in mind wouldn't you and worked towards that and it sounds like you really adapted and managed your expectations differently when when restrictions were put on you um yeah and I, I think as you say I think there are some elements of this that um yeah you'll be one of those people that forever will have got married uh, during this crazy time that will be part of your story won't it people yeah people will want to know about it won't they yeah and honestly I, I I just think it always sounded to me when I spoke to other people who had you know either been a bride or been around you know close family with somebody who got married that it always ends up kind of being you have the big expectation and the big wedding and the big stress and then something happens on the day and it kind of knocks it down a peg, knocks it down a peg. And what happened for us was that that big plan completely went out of the window. And then it was like we almost started from the most simple thing. And that meant that anything on the day that was like above and beyond, it just added Bonus. so yeah. much to the day. And it just it was genuinely like so much more than I ever could have expected it to be. Wow. And uh, yeah, it, I, I just, I, I mean, Matt and I just both looked at each other so many times in the day and just said, this is everything that it was supposed to be. This wow. is exactly what our wedding was supposed to be. So almost like in kind of stripping it back because you had to, it became bigger and better than you'd hoped. That's, yeah. That almost sounds like some kind of philosophy we should take into life, really. <laughs> like about expectations and oh, keeping to the main thing. And oh, that's amazing. Oh, well, I'm glad. I'm so glad that it was um, just wonderful for you Thank and it you. did look Thank beautiful. You said, Becky, about um, not living together and you've been living in different places. And so this means now that you've moved, does it? I mean, where are you now? Yes, yeah, so I'm now sitting in. Don't know if you can see out my window. Very foresty Berkshire. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that's where Matt's been here since uh, I think I want to say April last year. I think right. he moved here. Right. Um, yeah. So then I've uh, joined him since we got married. 
fantastic lovely and so you've moved away from Suffolk does that mean you've had to change your job as well or have you managed to still be doing the same job is, is that been another change you've got lots of change Marion uh, I know. <laughs> have you changed job as well <laughs> I know and um, yeah it was funny I had a conversation with my mum and she said she'd been watching this talk where they like explain that a person is only designed to be able to deal with so much life change at once <laughs> and like if, if a few things intersect then you're like pushed to breaking point and I was like tick 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 yeah no, <laughs> no so I was just a really um, amazing set of circumstances was um, originally uh, when kind of before lockdown or whatever I would have had to um, leave my job when I moved but because I'd been working remotely ah. since March and doing my job um, remotely since March uh, they've actually agreed on a kind of trial basis that I continue working remotely from here oh ah, um, brilliant so that's amazing because yeah. uh, that I don't have to change uh, that as well else at this stage um, so yeah so yeah, what is it, it you do what's the job so I work for a project called Inspiring Ipswich, which is a Church of England project. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, it's about basically helping uh, the Anglican churches in Ipswich to connect with more people and uh, make new disciples. Ah, brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. And that presumably feeds really well into uh, your faith. I know that you're um, a Christian. Does um, is that something that's been part of your life for a long time? Did you grow up in a uh, faith-based family? Just tell us yeah. a bit about your journey of faith. Sure, sure. So um, I yeah grew up in a um, Christian home. It's a slightly unique situation in that my um, mum was a very strong Christian when I was growing up, and my dad always came to church with us. And when I was young, I would have thought that my mum and dad. Um, had exactly the same journey of faith but actually okay. my dad didn't kind of come to faith himself in terms of making that decision yes this is what I'm going to stake my life on um, until I was about 14 15 wow. um, so that was one of one of the most extraordinary moments of my life was getting to watch my dad get baptized wow. um, and uh, yeah but we grew up in church in Ipswich um, so we went to church every Sunday um, was uh really encouraged by things like cym was very active okay. that's christian youth ministries when i was growing up so loads of different events where i got to meet people my age who shared my faith which was just the biggest thing for me yeah um and then like loads of sort of transformative moments at places like summer madness which is run by suffolk christian camps um and things like that yeah um, and then sort of um going forward in my faith journey i um studied biblical studies at university but that was at a secular university so the angle that you come at it from is like a historical critical is this right is this true is this accurate does this match with this etc etc and um that sent me on a journey that went in all different directions while I was at university. And obviously that coincides with everything you go through at university when you're away from home and you're struggling with, you know, making friends and yeah. all sorts of different things. So um, kind of my second year of university, my faith really took a dive and um, I was still clinging on to it. I still knew it was, um, I still believed God loved me. I've, believe that for many many years and that's anchored me for a long time but just just too many questions that I didn't okay. know how to um, work through and was that largely coming from the course and the and the teaching yeah 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 um not you that anticipated it that did you anticipate that in choosing the course were you expecting to be challenged in that way so a lot of people said that to me a lot of people said you know like, are you sure that you want to do it even? I did have people say, do you want to do it in that context? They'll really challenge your faith. And I thought, well, if it can't make it through that, then is it worth, yeah. you know, is it worth hanging on to? Like, I think that Christianity holds up kind of from a intellectual standpoint. standpoint and yeah. I still do think that now after I think that even more, having gone through that process of like very rigorously kind of unpicking it. Um, but yeah, and I'd also seen kind of, I think it's more of an American thing where there's this idea that um, 
students go to university and there's a professor who's like, you know, God doesn't exist and all of that. And none of my professors were like that. I think a lot okay. of them were Christians. Right. Um, but yes, they, it, it was, it was just this, um, just challenging things and asking questions that really you don't get equipped to ask through Sunday school and that sort of thing. A bit um, like, I guess, if you were studying philosophy, it would be the same kind of thing. I yeah. Think, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so were there lots of people on the course that weren't Christians? Yeah. 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 So yeah. it was quite a varied course, which was great actually to yeah. study the Bible alongside people who come at it from a totally different perspective. Yeah. Because um, I guess if you'd made a choice to do um, something like Moreland's, a, a, a Bible college, you would be having that teaching, but really saturated in that whole ethos of Christianity, wouldn't you? It would be a very different experience. Yeah, yeah. And I think the kind of, um, I guess, I mean, I can't speak for, for what that other side of it is like, mm. because I've never been to Bible college, yeah. but it sounds to me like um, the kind of focus in um the the university course that i was a part of it was like a history course sure it was it was more yeah. like a history course yeah um, rather than looking at kind of applying this and things like that so okay um, so what was it that uh, so if you had that kind of wobble in the second year what what would you put it down to that you kind of you know chose to stick with this path of faith that you've known and grown up with as opposed to diverting off and thinking differently so I think a few things. Um, I read a book by a guy called N.T. Wright, um, which, which was part of my course. Okay. And I just the book I'd read just before I read his book had been the kind of straw on the camel's back that had completely devastated okay. some of the things that my faith had been kind of built upon. And yeah. I thought, I don't know how to recover from this. I then read another book um, by a guy called N.T. Wright. And um, it was, it's an absolutely phenomenal read. It's called something like Jesus Christ and the victory of God. I should remember the title of singers. It was so <laughs> good. <laughs> it's like a meaty book, right. um, but it just showed me that there's like at every criticism and every um, kind of doubt that comes along. There is always, there is another side that there, okay. there is always something that Christianity has to respond to that. Right. And, um, and it and it reminded me of the Jesus that I, you know, saw as a child and thought, yeah, I'm going to follow him. Right. Um, I had really good people in my life who were encouraging me in my faith and mm. um, reminding me of kind of the, yeah, the, the truths that I had held on to when I was younger. Right. And also just hearing what God was doing in other people's lives. Right. I think to remind me that he's still he's still yeah. there even if I can't see him in my own yeah um but but really what I would always uh, what I reflected on when I got to the end of my course was you know I know that God was holding on to me when I wasn't holding on to him and and that's really I think the only thing that I can say completely to make sense of mm. um, how my faith stayed kind of <laughs> in one piece mm. yeah but then there was also a rebuilding of like learning the history of the New Testament and the historical evidence for Jesus and things uh, genuinely now gives me not just so, so that one side was like the, the heart thing of keeping my faith alive and that kind of. Yeah. But I genuinely ended my course thinking I'm convinced that like this stuff happened. And that there was a resurrection and that Jesus lived and he did say these things and that yeah. these things are an accurate representation of history. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So there was like all sorts of kind of rebuild yeah. that went on there. Really so, yeah. interesting. Do you, um, would you say that we should all do it to an extent, that we should <laughs> all have that kind of study and knowledge and that it actually um, informs our faith? is there a frustration with you that we haven't all got that yeah i think everybody should endeavor to understand a bit of the world that the bible comes out of because i think it's so there is so much and it's and it's not kind of core truths i'm not talking about like fundamentals of faith mm -hmm. but there's so much in like the practice of so the um, context in which you're saying. yeah 
yeah. that you miss and there's also things that we can easily buy into and not challenge if we don't understand what it is you know what was the point that the writer really wanted to make because mm. we can get hung up on what does he say and then we translate it into our modern day before we ask well what was he actually intending yeah in that yeah and um yeah i mean i could go on and on and on about <laughs> of that and just t- times when i was like whoa i can't right. believe it that, it's um, so interesting so interesting and i i know we've had the privilege at times becky of um you speaking at the forge uh, and this this is why <laughs> because you have such great things to say and you're so you're so young and you're so wise um is is this kind of a passion of yours is that anything that you're pursuing you know speaking i i, I know it's something you've done with us a little bit is is it something that you really endeavor to do more or are doing i don't know if you are doing it now yeah so i um i just love um the power of being helped to think well about things and i've had lots of people who have helped me do that in my life and i love at least trying to communicate that (laughs) and um it's definitely something that i'm trying to grow in and um i absolutely love i mean it's simultaneously the most petrifying thing i've ever done (laughs) (laughs) is um is like teaching at camps or at forge um i mean when i'm doing the prep i'm thinking why do i why am i doing this i should never do this i should never put myself through (laughs) again (laughs) and uh kind of everything apart from the 20 minutes where i'm doing it i'm like i shouldn't do this (laughs) um and then when you do it you feel like it's the real rightness about it when I'm doing it sometime, I mean, there's definitely been times where I'm thinking like I'm getting my, because, um, I'm like full of thoughts and I find it, I, I like to think about things in like the complexity. And when you do a talk, you want to get all of that complexity done in the prep. And then you want that like nice little iceberg you know, and yes. sometimes I bring too much of the, <laughs> the other so stuff much. in, or at least it's in my brain still when I'm, yeah. <laughs> so um, what would be your absolute, if you had a complete, because I guess often like uh, if you're speaking, often it's as part of a series or you might be given a topic or a yeah. subject, but if you had a complete um, open platform, what, what would be your your real thing what's your passion what's your heart what do you really want to to teach on so people who know me well know that I'm very (laughs) opinionated so I've got all sorts of things that I'll like go on a little rant over okay Um, there's there are there are different things there's there are things that um coming out from stuff that I realized in my course there's things I learned when I was studying kind of the New Testament um, about uh, what the Bible actually says about women and particularly what it says about women in the church and women as leaders uh, that I want more people to know about because right. I think the church has got it seriously. You know, there's still, even in modern churches like the Forge, there are still, I'm sure, um, amongst kind of the community, there will be some people who have still some real questions about you know actually what is the bible saying about the relationship between women and men and women as leaders and those Mm. sorts of things that's one thing that's probably not for a sunday (laughs) (laughs) Um, but um i think i suppose we always want to um talk about the things that kind of bother us or or cause us and the thing i think that is bothering me most at the moment is the kind of cultural conversation that we're having around mental well-being okay and the impact that it might be having on the next generation because i think what we um you know you know when we have let's say um an, an epidemic of something that Um, also has a stigma around it you always have kind of two parallel 
things that happen. One is we must alleviate the stigma because it's not right that people who are suffering with this have a stigma attached to it. So you saw that happen, let's say with something like um, HIV, we have yeah. to remove the stigma, but we also say we have to get, we have to eradicate this. You know, this is ruining lives and ruining families and we have to eradicate it. And the thing that I'm really concerned about for the next generation is that we're getting really good at removing the stigma around struggles with mental well-being, but we're not ardent enough in saying we don't want this for the next generation. We don't want the next generation. You know, we have this phrase, it's okay to not be okay, which is a great thing to say to an individual. But as a society, I feel like we're now saying it's okay that everyone's not okay. And it's yeah. not okay <laughs> that yeah. everyone's not so okay. So do you mean you think that almost in raising the profile and allowing people to be, that we're actually encouraging people to to almost explore something that maybe they weren't going to be anyway or uh, struggles that they didn't really have? Um, I don't, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's quite that. I think it's, it, it kind of feels like the only solution that we're offering. So I, I want to steer away from talking about kind of medically diagnosable mental health issues because I, would get myself in all sorts of trouble because I, I'm not qualified to talk about that. Um, but I feel like there, there needs to be both. You have to simultaneously be removing the stigma for people who are really struggling. Yeah. And also as a society, you know, the numbers are rocketing. We need yeah. to be saying this is not, we're not okay with this for the next generation. So what are we going to be saying and what are we going to be doing in order to bring that down because i don't think it's inevitable and i think we're getting to the stage now where we think it's inevitable yeah and i think the best message that young people are getting at the moment is self-acceptance mm. you know just kind of that's the that's the solution mm. and i'm i'm just asking the question is that the, is that the solution mm. is it solving it because it seems like we're always talking about that and yet still the numbers are going up mm. Mm. and and I'm just not convinced because self-acceptance to me doesn't hold a lot of hope mm. because there are all sorts of things about myself that I will never accept because I don't I don't you know things I think and things I feel mm. um I just I think there's something better and something more kind of hopeful that we can be saying to the next generation. Yeah. For me as a Christian, it's the acceptance, not of self, but the acceptance of grace. Mm. And what difference the acceptance of grace means mm. for the acceptance of myself. Because mm. grace says, you know, self-acceptance is, this is what I am. Ah, okay, right, I've got to accept it. I've got to learn to be happy with it. Mm. But grace is, you know, I'm not what I used to be. I, this is what I currently am. And I know that God is making me into something, you know, new and better. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think we just need a more compelling, more hopeful message for, yeah. you know, I look, my brothers are both in high school still. And I hear some of the things that not that they're saying necessarily, but kind of the things that they're surrounded with on social media and whatever. Yeah. And self-acceptance is really the best that's being offered to them. Mm. And I think there's something better, mm. you know? Yeah, so yeah. These are, but I'm still formulating. <laughs> but this, it's there is so interesting, in yeah. And we have a responsibility in that, don't we? We yeah. have a responsibility to, to share that message. I think we really do. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I just don't. I just don't want to accept that that's that that's inevitable now. No. That, yeah, yeah, that this is going to be a problem for the next generation. So, so these are the sorts of things. And I wonder, like over lockdown, I've been thinking, you know, do I need to take to YouTube <laughs> or whatever? Yeah, I, I don't honestly, know. Becky, I think this is what is so great about you. Even just sitting here with you tonight, you just. Um, yeah, you just make me think 
and you come at things at a different angle uh yeah i think you're inspiring and so so wise yeah it's it's great to talk to you i could i could talk to you for ages i think you've got so much to say on so many things it's wonderful but um i think to wrap up i'm going to ask you a really big question which um i think you'll be able to answer this you'll have thought about this sort of thing (laughs) um if you had the means or the power or the magic or whatever to change things uh anything to change things locally nationally and globally what were the three what three changes would you make locally nationally and globally yeah wow okay so um locally um I I love I love boys because I've got younger brothers and I just really love boys and I would change <laughs> that would be our quote that could be my strap line when I, I love put this out that I love boys <laughs> I love boys. <laughs> I I would change the fact that um so many boys grow up without a dad that would be my thing locally yeah um nationally I would change our excessive consumerism and I would shut everything on Sundays again. Uh, Not because of church, just because I think it's important for us to stop uh, buying. And uh, globally, um, access to education for girls. There you go. (laughs) Why would you stop us buying? What's behind that? so much um in just huge increase in people being in debt in our society um which like takes you captive and nobody wants it um fast fashion and everything it's doing for the environment and for the just the whole chain supply and um and i just think it's good for people to be not caught up in the needing more and the busyness and the frantic you know i think people have noticed it people did notice it at the beginning of lockdown and we've lost it now yeah absolutely i I think we all need to breathe a bit yeah that would definitely be one of mine uh yeah to to rid the world of the virus but actually to take something from this time and i think my thing which would tie into what you're saying my thing would be that we would all rest that we would all know what it is to stop and to yeah to give ourselves a day or or whatever we can but something that yeah we were saying was indicative of the the beginning Mm. of the virus for some of us not for all of us i realize for some people it was even more crazy but for some of us i think we just went ah and rested and yeah, yeah just just found uh enjoyment and um more meaning in just being at home just yeah Mm. being involved with family in a different way eating at home every night and yeah i think there's something very powerful in in rest as well yeah Mm. oh becky oh honestly i love talking to you i think we are going to hear lots from you over the years i think you're really insightful really wise and um it's been a real privilege to talk to you this evening i'm really great oh it's a joy to talk to you always helen oh thank you thanks for giving us your time and again congratulations on (laughs) being married (laughs) thank you (laughs) thank you it's really kind thank you you. bye Bye. Bye. bye